And Lord, that today that some hearts might be changed. Lord, some for salvation's sake. Lord, there are some sitting in this building today. Lord, I'm sure that if they die tonight, they don't know where they go. And Lord, I pray you save them before it's everlasting too late. And Lord, I, I pray for those who are saved. God, there are things that we need you, God, to straighten our hearts out about today. And Lord, we can't wait any longer. Lord, I pray today, God, that you be honored by what's done in this place. Lord, I ask now that you help me preach as a dying man to dying people. Lord, hide me behind the cross that your son might be high and lifted up. Lord Jesus, draw him to your side as you said you would. I trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We started out last week looking at our responsibility. We looked at the first week we looked at who God's people were. And then we started last week looking at our responsibility as it relates to 2 Chronicles 7 14. And I told you, and I want to reiterate this because I, I know we missed the point so many times. But this is one of the promises of God. It is a conditional promise of God. I cannot say that enough. That it is, if my people which are called by my name shall do four things, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Those four things. God says, then I will do something. Then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now, I'm not going to attempt to preach on that last part there until next Sunday. So today, I want you to focus in on shall humble themselves, or not shall humble themselves, but shall seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. We looked at shall humble themselves and pray last week. Today, we're looking at seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Now, I want you to understand that as we find ourselves being honest, and, and no doubt, those of you who were here last week, you know this altar was full. People were praying. And I, I, and I hope and pray uh, that, that a lot of business was done between people and God. And that a lot of people really got honest. Uh, that we really got down and said, God, this is where I'm at. This is how my relationship is. This is where I find myself at in relation to you. And so today, we're looking at, now that we've been honest, now that we've prayed and told God exactly where we're at, that we have something else we must do. Because there are two things here that he asked for uh, for us to do as well. And you know what? We, we talk about this, and I've said this, and I've said this again last night. God wants to send revival to this country. God wants to turn this nation back to Him. But He'll not force it upon us. He's not going to make us go back to Him. Matter of fact, God will let us choose our own path. He will allow us to choose our own destiny. And listen, for people who are lost here today, He will allow you to choose to dwell in a place called hell for all eternity. He, and listen, it matters to you. You think, well, God don't care. Listen, it matters to you. It breaks His heart that He sent His Son to die. And yet people reject Him and die and go to hell. But listen, friends, He's not going to force people to go to heaven because He wants people to come to Him who love Him and want Him and want a relationship with Him. But listen, it is dependent upon, it, it, it is totally, it, it will totally be determined in this nation whether this nation turns back to God based on what we do in response to God. You say, us right here at Pleasant you listen. If, if we would do it, if the church down the road would do it, if the church down the road would do it, if we would all be here in our own congregations, in our own fellowships, uh, wherever we meet, whenever we meet, to begin to honestly assess ourselves and to get honest with God and to ask God to show us where we fall short. Listen, if we would do that, God would begin His work in our heart. And listen, it don't take long, listen, to find out what God can do when His people are humble, responsive, desiring His will, attempting to carry out His will. It does not take long to find out what God can do with a people yielded to Him. Yeah. <coughs> oh, well, this nation is too far gone. It's, to, it's seen its better days. And that's the attitude of a lot of people in church. <laughs> that's the attitude of a lot of people sitting in the pew this nation it's just the way it is brother Jeff no it don't, it don't have to be that way see, see there was a time in another land 
when some people were being told they had to worship God in a certain way. They were told they had to do it this way. And that they were to live by these rules. And that everything would be okay if they just knew what they were being told to do. But they realized that God wanted to be real to them and God wanted a relationship with them. And it wasn't for man to determine how they worshipped Him or how, they, how, how they, they connected to God. But it was based on what them and God, a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship, that's what it was based on. And you know what they did? Right. They packed up their stuff and they headed for a new land. And that land is the land of the United States of America right. that we live in today. This right. nation was founded on religious liberty right. and freedom right. and principles of God found in God's Word. It was not founded on political correctness. It was not founded on the culture and popularity of that day. It was founded upon the rock of ages. His name hey. is Jesus yeah. Christ. It's high time for God's people to understand that if this nation is to be turned back to God, it begins here. That's right. That's right. It begins here. It begins with a people who say we're religious. A people who say we have a connection to God. It begins with those people. See, he said, seek my face. Seek my face. Now, I want you to understand something about seeking his face. Because we live in a culture where technology has taken us to places that, that people of the Bible could have only uh, imagined, maybe not even imagined because they didn't think it possible. But we live in an age when if I want to talk to you, if I want to hear from you, if I want to get uh, your opinion on something, that what I will do is uh, I, I, can, I can get on my telephone, I can get on my cell phone. I can get on my webcam. I can get on the internet. I can get on Facebook and Twitter and everything else. And I can contact you and I can hear from you. But see, in, in, in the day that we're studying about here in 2 Chronicles 7.14, if you want to hear from somebody, especially if you want to see them face to face, if you want to look them eyeball to eyeball and find out what was going on with them and say, I want, to, I, I want to know your opinion on this. I want to hear from you. Listen, to see their face, the, the culture was so primitive, the, 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 uh, everything was so primitive in that day that they had to go and get in the presence of the person they wanted to hear from. Right. So you know what God's really saying? He said two things to me here. He said, first of all, that if you're going to experience me, if you're going to have this revival, if you're going to see your nation turn back to me, if you're going to see your land healed, if you're going to see your sin forgiven, if you want me to hear what you got to say, then you're going to have to experience me. And in order to experience me, it will require your or require my presence. It will require my presence. Seek my faith. Humble yourself. Pray. Seek my faith. Psalms 27, 8 says this, When thou saidest, Seek my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Listen, God told us to seek His face. God is waiting for a people that is hungry for His presence. Hungry for His presence. I've been in churches a lot of churches. And I've told you this before. But I've been around and I've seen and I know that a lot of times people come into churches and we've been guilty of it ourselves. We come in with zero expectation on God. You know what? If we come in with zero expectation, guess what happens? Nothing. Right, right. Because you know why? I'm not anticipating encountering, encountering God. You're not anticipating encountering God. And God says, well, they don't, they don't have no expectations so fine. See, it all starts with our response to God. If we have an expectation that God will show up, He will. Amen. Now, some people, they, they want God's presence, but they want God's presence on their terms. Right. I'll have God when I'm in worship service. When Brother Jeff's up there screaming his guts out in the pulpit, I'll, I'll have the presence of God. 
When, when we have Bible study, I, I'll have the presence of God. When, I, when, when we have worship on Sunday night, I'll have the presence of God. When we have Bible study on Wednesday night, I'll have the presence of God. But as far as the presence of God goes, a lot of people, they don't understand the fact that we need the presence of God on our life, or we should desire the presence of God on our life every single day. Yeah. Every single day. And part of why there's not the joy, you know, the Bible speaks of unspeakable joy. Unspeakable joy. You know why I find that so many Christians are not enjoying the Christian life? Because they don't feel the presence of God as they go about day to day. Well, we do you we believe in you. Yeah, I do. See, we need to be a people. The people of God need to be a people that go to work, to school, to the store, to ball games. Out to eat in the presence of God. You say, you lost your mind, preacher. You want us to go sit down and eat at a restaurant in the presence of God sit down with us? Yeah, I do. Right. You know what? I've had people come up to me. You know, Brother Jim, I talk to these people. And you know what they tell me? They say, you're just so different. They, you're just so different. You know, I, I, I just never met anybody like you, you know? You, you've had those people, I'm sure, right? I've had those people. You've had those people that because you value things differently or you look at them through a different way than the world does, they're like, you're different. Why are you different? And for a long time I thought, oh yeah, you know why it is? It's because it's because we're goody goody Christians. Yeah. We good people. That's why we're different. <coughs> no, you know why? Because if you are a child of God, then the Bible says that you are the temple Amen. of God. Amen. The Bible says that God Himself has dwelt in your heart. The Bible says that He has sit down on the throne of your heart. Amen. Hello? Amen. Now we still got people who, who, who misunderstand that God sat down on the throne of, uh, of your heart. Guess what? You don't get to make the decisions no more. Amen. You don't even get to decide what's right and wrong anymore. Guess who does? He does. Hello? See, the reason that people know that you're different and the reason that they notice that you're different is because of the presence of God. Amen. The presence of God. Now, there's some people sitting there going, well, Bridget, people never tell me that. Well, dear God, we need to work on it. Amen. We, need, we need to get the presence of God into your life. We need to get you in a shape where when you walk out, you sit down in a restaurant, people walk up and go, what's wrong with you? When you walk into a room, heads turn and say, what just happened here? Listen, the Bible talks about the a song and praying for that the presence of God come fill this place. Come fill this place. Listen, the prayer of a, uh, of a people who surrender and yielded to God needs to be, come fill this heart. Come fill this body, Lord. I want your presence to flow out of me. You may not believe that it's true this morning that when you walk into a room, if you are living in the will of God, that the presence of God comes and stands in the room with you. But I want you to understand this. Understand this. God walks with you every day. Amen. And this relationship's not Amen. something that we just preach about and it never happens for people. It's a relationship that He 100% wants with you. And as I think about seeking His face, the, the verse that, that comes to mind every time I think about seeking His face is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. This is what it says. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Diligently seek Him. See, it says... You can't please God. You can't do enough good things. You can't do enough works to please God. All that you can do is come in faith, believing that God is and He's done what He said He did, and that He'll reward you for seeking Him. But it says, how are you supposed to seek Him? Diligently seek Him. Now, I looked that up to see what that means. How, how would that be translated for us? To diligently seek Him. It means to seek out for oneself. Beg, pray. I've never been on drugs. Some of y'all probably think I have. Well, I have to but I've never been on drugs. But let me tell you something. I crave.
to, to, to be in the presence of God, to be close to my Savior as much as any addict does a drug. Amen. Did you hear me? Well, it's a terrible comparison, Brother Jim. Well, they think they got a habit. They think they need it. You know what? I need it. I want it. I want him to show up and I want him to do something beyond Jeff Cripps. I want him to show up and do something beyond Pleasant View Baptist Church. Because when I leave here, I want to know that I'll be in the presence of God, not in the presence of people. And I'm not above or beyond begging God to show up in this place. See, I don't know if it's so much craving as it is starving for it to happen. See, I want it to happen in such a way that, that people sit back. And some of these people who sit back all blurry eyed, stone hearted. I want, I, I want God to show up in such a way, His presence to come stand in this room in such a way that guess what happens? They get a good dose of love. <laughs> and they smile. Amen. They might even laugh because they're so overcome with the Spirit because God showed up and touched them and they said, Woo, that felt good because I experienced that in 50 years. Amen. <laughs> oh, you don't mean that, Brother Jeff? Yeah, I do. Because there's some people that are lost as last year's Easter eggs. They don't know what it means to be saved. They, they, they don't understand what it means to be saved. The reason they can't enjoy good Christian fellowship is because they're not a Christian, so they can't enjoy that kind of fellowship. And you know what? There's even people in church, and it amazes me, the people in church who think they've got everything figured out. I got it all together, Brother Jeff. You're not talking to me today. I got it all figured out. Listen. I'll tell you when I'll have it all figured out. When this body dies and I get my new body and I stand before my Savior, I'll have it all figured out. But until then, my friends, just like that old song that, that the kids used to sing all the time, He's still working on me. Amen. Every day. Every day. See, when you think you've arrived, you might want to start over at square one. When you think you've got it all figured out. See, I want God to show up in this place in such a way that people who think they have it figured out really just, really figure out just how much they really need God. Amen. Oh, friends, that we would have a Holy Ghost revival coming up. That God would send a revival and that the people would be ready to receive it because God wants to send it. But that the people would be ready to receive it that would turn this community right side up, this county right side up, and begin a fire that spreads across the nation. Yeah. Oh, you're dreaming big, Brother Jeff. Yes, yes. Well, I find in the New Testament that there were some disciples and they were just a little bit fearful. But as they sat in a room one day, trying to figure out how they were going to serve God and what they needed to do, after everything they'd seen and heard, that the Holy Spirit come and sat down on them like a flame of fire. The second thing that God said to me was, to seek my face is to know and do my work. Now, I love my wife. But if me and her never talk, <laughs> if there's a gap in communication, how much do I really know about her? Matter of fact, she needs some things from me from time to time. Go clean the garage, mow the yard. She needs to go do some man stuff, you know? But if I don't ever talk to her, then guess what? I don't know what she needs from me. <coughs> I don't know what she needs. It might be something related to our kids. But if I don't ever talk to her, if I'm never in her presence, then guess what? I won't know. And, and I definitely, probably, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say probably, but probably for me definitely, <laughs> will not do what she needs me to do if she don't tell me. <laughs> and for her to tell me it would require for me to seek her face to get in front of her and to say what do you need from me see it's just like that with God 
See, I find so many times that when I fall into the conviction of the Holy Spirit and God starts dealing with my heart and I, and I get honest with God, because I am by no means perfect. So anybody who's got that idea, sorry. That's why you're here, because Brother Jeff's perfect and we're all going to follow Brother Jeff's example. You need to go home right now. <laughs> get up and go. Because I'm a human. But I find that when I get honest with God, that there is always something that God was wanting to say to me. You see, for the people to hear from God at that time, they had to go down to the temple. They didn't have the, the luxury that you and I have today that we just pray to God. I mean, we got Jesus. We just go to Him. We go to our intercessor. And we say, Lord, this is what I need. God, this is what's going on in my heart. And God hears and God does. They had to go down to the temple where the presence of God was. They had to get in His, pre in His presence to talk to Him. To talk, even, to, even not just to talk to Him, but to talk to the priest so the priest could talk to God. See, for them to know His will for their life would require them getting in His presence. It's not enough when it comes to seeking God to want Him to just hear and forgive and heal. We've got to make the effort to, to, to humble ourselves, pray, to seek His face. And we'll talk about the fourth here in a second, but we've got to make the effort there. <coughs> See, this, this revival that we claim to want so bad in this nation, that we profess to want in this nation, not just in this church, but in this nation, it's not as tough to say, oh God, okay God, here we are. Routine Sunday, we're here, you know, we're just waiting. When are you going to send it? When are you going to send it? You know what the world says? The world's totally foolish. The world looks and says, well, your God ain't showed up and do nothing about this. God said there saying, I want to. But not people. But not people. See, if we're, if we're to experience God, we're going to have to make a change. See, we're going to have to begin asking God, God, what's your will for my life? Not, not seeking our will for our life and then asking God to bless it or asking God to line up with what our will is. See, for far too long, even Christian people have been doing what they want. They've lived their life for themselves. And it, it's going to require us to say, God, I want to live for you. See, the verse that comes to mind here is in Luke chapter 6. Jesus is teaching about two different ways you can handle your house. He said, Whosoever cometh to me and hear my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. Verse 48, he is a, He's like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Verse 49, But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of the house was great. Listen, this describes the difference between a person that hears from God and follows His will for their life, and a person who hears from God but does nothing with it. So it also describes somebody getting saved. Do you think being saved is God's will for your life? It is. But guess what? There's other things that are God's will for your life too. And so, if we want the, if we want the house to stand strong, if we, want, if we want to see God do things in our life, it requires us hearing from Him and Him doing what He says. And that is building upon the foundation which has been laid, which no other man can lay. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. But to hear from God and do nothing with it, It's foolishness. What do you mean, Brother Jim? People hear from God all the time. And they go on and, and, they, and they go on and they go against the grain and they go against the grain and they fight against the will of God for their life. And then they say, why is this not working out? Why are things not going the way that they should? Because we're pushing against God. Right. And guess what? He's a whole lot bigger than you. You boys will probably run up against some pretty big boys in football, man. 
Oh, dear Lord. You know, we push and we push and we push. And sometimes we beat them down and sometimes they beat us down. That's how it is with the will of God sometimes, y'all. When you go against the will of God, you find a fight. You think that? Yeah. You find a fight that, that you can't win. But when you, when you find... Uh, when you find yourself following the will of God for your life, everything <coughs> begins to move. And it begins to go. And even though sometimes there's still rough patches, because I'm not telling you that it won't be rough sometimes, it's a whole lot easier to walk with God than to walk against God. Right. See, doing this right here, seeking His face, will require every person asking God, is there anything in my life in opposition to your will for me? Here's the last thing he said. And turn from their wicked way. See, this right here could derail the whole thing. See, we could be honest to God about where we are. We could pray to Him and, and Him here. And, and, and we could experience His presence. But right here, if we don't do this, it could stop all the progress we've made towards seeing God send a great revival. Enjoying afresh the presence of God in our lives. See, this is the danger. We say, I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry, God. But I'm going to go back over here. I'm going to go back to what I just told you I was sorry for. I'm going to go back to what I just told you I've been honest about. God's sitting there saying, no, no, no. There's a better way. It's over here. It's this way. See, repentance. See, see, there's a big difference. We understand forgiveness. Everybody wants to be forgiven. Everybody wants to go to heaven. But repentance is on us. God doesn't <coughs> repent for us. We repent for ourselves. What do you mean by that? We make a decision that that's how we were going, but I'm never going back. I'm never going back. I'm never going to be like that again. But Brother Jeff, I, I mess up sometimes and try to go back this way. That's when you stop. You get honest with God and you go this way. You don't ever make it all the way back over here. You don't ever find yourself all the way stuck back over here living this lifestyle again. You get honest with God and every time you find yourself wanting to go back to the way it was, you know what you do? You get down on your knees again. You get humble again and you admit where you are and then you head the other direction. <coughs> See, humbling yourself is the difference in pride and admitting where you really are. I'm going to tell you something. You have to rationalize your sin. If you have to rationalize your sin, then you're stuck with pride about your sin. Now, if you don't have to rationalize it, but you get down before God and admit it, then you've got humbling yourself here. Right? Right. But turning from your wicked ways is the difference in being sorry you got caught and genuinely being sorry and determined never to walk that way. Right. See, that's repentance. We know a lot about asking God to forgive, but what about our desire to repent, to say no more? What do you mean? <laughs> Sometimes I just want to say, sin, you have robbed me of my joy. Sin, you have damaged my relationship with people around me. Sin, you have, you have killed my relationship with God. Sin, you have cost me more in my life than I have ever dreamed. Sin, you have tried to keep me locked out of the presence of God, but no more. Proverbs 28, 13, the Bible says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Let's be honest. Because we can be honest, we're in church. From the pulpit to the pew, 90% of us try to keep our sins when no one can see. Because we don't want anybody to find out how we really are. 
because we don't know what they think. We don't know how they'd react if they did find out. But then it comes to life. And you say, oh my goodness. But here's the problem. Here's where we mess up and misunderstand. God saw it all. Whether the gospel church member saw it, whether the pastor saw it, whether a deacon saw it, whether a fellow church member, whether, whether a little kid saw it, God saw it. Because He sees everything. You see, sometimes we think, and even myself, we think, we think, oh, well, well I, I'm stuck in this sin, and I'm just going to keep it right there. Do you know what God said right there in Proverbs 28? He said, trying to cover it up is what's really wrong with you. Because the Bible says if we would confess it, tell God about it, and forsake it, repent, and turn away from it, then guess what we experience? The mercy of God in our life. Oh, yeah. The mercy of God. <laughs> Unmerited favor. Exactly what we do not deserve. See, many people today, including people in the church, are sorry that they got caught. But they're not sorry of what they have done. They have not made up their mind and heart to never walk that way again. And you know why that is? Because we have gotten so used to sin wrecking our life. We've gotten so used to walking around without the presence of God being so real to us that it don't even bother us in some cases. See, if we're to experience revival individually as a church, we're going to have to go the other way. We're going to have to forsake sin. We're going to have to quit coming back to the same sin and the same pleasures and walking away empty-handed again. And walking away guilty again. And walking away feeling like, where are you, God? To knowing the power of His presence every day. And the Bible teaches in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, as well as many other places in Scripture, that it begins and ends with us. His response to us is determined by our response to Him. It begins by admitting who we are and ends by making a decision never to walk that way. To never walk that way. Listen, I, I want to share this. I don't do this all the time anymore. I used to do it more frequently than I do, but I want to share this with you. I just feel compelled to, to share this with you again. Most everybody in here seen this, right? Okay. But this little red man represents everybody in the whole world. Every man, woman, boy, or girl. The light represents God because the Bible says that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. But the darkness around man represents sin. And sin always separates us from God. If we're, if we're lost, if you don't get saved and ask Jesus to come into your heart, one day your sin will separate you for an eternity in a place called hell. If you're saved, it disconnects your fellowship. Remember last week when I picked up the phone and cut the cord? Or for you techno technologically advanced children and youth and teenagers and adults, your cell phone just lost service. But it always separates us from God. But God didn't leave us that way. The Bible says that God commends His love toward us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died. A holy God Dying for sinful people. But he did it. Matter of fact, he said, No man's going to take my life from you. I'm going to lay it down. And just that's what he did on the cross. He did that one day as he hung there. He said, It is finished. And the Bible says he gave up the ghost. And he died, and they put him in a barred tomb and put soldiers in a stone to guard a dead man. Now, what sense does that make? Guard a dead man. I did one. Because in their hearts they knew. They knew he was exactly who he said he was. And they wanted to keep him in there because if he was who he said he was, oh boy, they was going to pay. Because that meant he was God. And on the third day, he did exactly what he said he'd do. He got up from the grave. He defeated death and hell in the grave. And in doing that, He built a bridge. See, the cross builds a bridge. Not good works, not baptism. The cross built the bridge. 
so that sinful man could get to holy God. The way, we've seen the old song, the way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. There's no other way. If there had been, God had done it another way. But there wasn't, so He did it this way. So that sinful man could get to holy God. And today He reaches out His nail-scarred hand. He says, you don't have to die and go to a place called hell. But you can go to heaven with me. But you got to trust Him. You gotta put your hand in mine. You gotta let go. Quit, quit trusting in anything else you've ever been told. Trust in me. Trust in me. Trust in me. Hands are bowed and eyes are closed.